everyone and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. And the museum is located on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen, known today as the Songhees and Squamut First Nations. And I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and to learn here on this territory. And because we have people joining us from all over BC, I see Burnaby and Surrey and uh, a few other places, I'd like to encourage you to consider the traditional territory on whose land you are on today. So RBCM at Home began over a year ago when our museum and archive closed due to the pandemic. And it was an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now, even though the museum has reopened, we've continued this program as a way of staying connected with people at home or at school around the province. And this program and all of our previous ones have been recorded and you can find them on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. Today, we're going to learn more about the Broken Promises and Exhibit on now the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center in Burnaby. Grounded in research from Landscapes of Injustice, a shirk funded seven year multidisciplinary, multi-institutional community engagement project. This exhibit explores the dispossession of Japanese Canadians in the 1940s. I'm joined by Dr. Yasmin Amratanga Railton, co-curator of the exhibit. Yasmin has over 15 years of professional experience leading arts and cultural organizations in the UK and Canada and is currently an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. Yasmin, this has been a long and involved project. How are you feeling now that the exhibit is being shared with the public? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Kim, for having me and um, also for the territorial acknowledgement. Um, it's been such a such a joy to be part of this project. As I mentioned before we started live, this um, this was a project that brought me back to Canada after many years in the UK, and I felt really privileged to have been able to learn this history and have an opportunity to share it more broadly. And so now we're at a point where we are we've we've launched the exhibit. It's touring across the country, and it's um yeah it's terribly exciting so i'm really pleased to be able to share some of the some of the behind the scenes stories and how um how the exhibit came together today oh exciting and i know you've got some images to share with us um so why don't i let you get started you can share your screen take us through uh, for folks who've joined us live and are watching you can um any questions you have that come up, please feel free to use the chat and Q&A. I will make it my job to watch that and I'll pass along any questions. Um, either during, I might interrupt you gently if it seems important to address it right away or I'll save them for the end. But for now, over to you. Perfect, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining today. Um, as Kim mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about my curatorial work today um, on the Broken Promises exhibit and I had the great pleasure of collaborating with the Landscapes of Injustice team, and in particular working with Leah Best, who's the head of knowledge at the Royal BC Museum, and Sherry Kajiwara, the director curator at the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center in bringing this exhibit together, along with a much broader team. And I hope that I'll include shout outs to everybody in the course of my talk. Um, and as we said, this is really a Canadian history project. And, um, Generally, it's talking about ideas of um, wartime Canada and racism and injustice that happened at that time. Specifically, we're looking at the dispossession of Japanese Canadians on the west coast of Canada. So I'm gonna talk us through today a bit of that history and how we try to find a way to create sort of a community engaged approach to telling this history, giving people a platform to tell their own stories, and making this all of the research that Landscapes of Injustice has done, making that accessible to the broader public. So let us dive right in. Um, as Kim mentioned, Landscapes of Injustice is a seven-year community-engaged research project. And the Royal BC Museum is among one of 16 museums, universities, community organizations, and other partners who have come together to really work on, um, on this project. Um, 
the first four years were research, and then we dove into what we call knowledge mobilization. And in really plain terms, that means translating all of this incredible, rich, historical, geographical, legal history into public facing initiatives. So ways that we can share all of the lessons learned more broadly. And those include things like teacher resources for BC curriculum, um, a narrative website, a digital archival repository where you can um, search archival records, and this museum exhibit that I'm going to be talking about today. The exhibit itself, um, a little shout out, I'm delighted that it's on display currently at the UK National Museum and Cultural Centre, and it's going to be touring across the country to museums including the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, the Japanese Canadian Cultural Centre in Toronto, the Galt Museum and Archives, Museum of Surrey. I know we have some guests from Surrey, so you'll have the opportunity to see it in your own community in the coming um, months and years, and also at the Royal BC Museum. Um, let us, without further ado, push into the history a little bit because I think it is important to get a bit of context. And this is really very much a history that's still in living memory. And we ask the question a lot like, why is this important now? And as we'll see, it feels like these stories of injustice are important to, this feels like an important moment in time to reflect upon lessons learned in history. So take a sip of tea. In 1941, in the wake of Pearl Harbor, the Canadian federal government enacted the War Measures Act. And that effectively um, gave authority to seize Japanese Canadian fishing vessels off the Pacific coast of Canada, um, basically because they were perceived as threats. Um, in the month that followed, um, despite the fact that the large majority of Japanese Canadians who were living in Canada were indeed the equivalent to Canadian citizens, Japanese Canadians were assembled in detention centers such as at Hastings Park and then forcibly sent to internment camps. In March of 1942, over 21,000 Japanese Canadians were forcibly removed from coastal British Columbia. While the government had initially promised to protect the property of those interned, within a year, this process actually proved untenable and the Canadian government authorized the sale of virtually everything that Japanese Canadians were forced to leave behind. Um, the, by 1940, January, 1943, um, the forced sale of Japanese Canadian real estate, um, under the control of the custodian of enemy properties meant that homes, businesses, farmlands, fishing vessels were all effectively sold. As a result, when the internment era finally ended in 1949, and I think it worth, is worth mentioning, this is four years after the end of World War II, um, Japanese Canadians had nothing to return to after being in internment camps. Their, homes, their personal belongings, in short, everything was gone. And while the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 can be seen as maybe catalyzing some of these events, I think it is really important to underscore that there was a, there was a pervasive racial tension that was in, this was in Western Canada, this was in Canada. And that's part of what made some of these measures somewhat palatable. And so this is very much a story of um, the bureaucratic underpinning of how did this happen, but also personal accountability and how do we, how do we understand how these things happen today? Um, landscapes of injustice, part of the objective there was really to understand um, the dispossession of property. And that means those four sales that I talked about, but also theft and vandalism of properties that were meant to be left in government care. Um, that also includes other kinds of properties, things like family heirlooms and personal belongings, pets. There were also intangible losses. Because of the forced sale of real estate, there was no, as a result of this, there are no Japanese Canadian communities in the West Coast, of, or neighborhoods rather, in the West Coast of Canada. Um, there are lost opportunities of education, 
of livelihoods, retirement. And so as a curator, part of this was a confrontation of my own um, limitations. This was a history that I wasn't taught in school and it felt important to share this bit of Canadian history. But I had this bizarre task as a curator to consider how do you curate an exhibit that is fundamentally about the loss of objects? When we think about curating as being bringing things together. So I didn't have objects, but what I did have was paper and a lot of paper, actually. The, I mentioned Landscapes of Injustice was a research project and the point of origin of this was some 250,000 archival records that were buried in libraries and archives Canada. Um, the first four years of the landscapes project, our fastidious researchers did an incredible job combing through and digitizing 15,000 case files um, from the office of the custodian of enemy property, um, enactments, orders and councils, bylaws, um, and also letters of protest from Japanese Canadians. Um, I've included an excerpt here from one such letter. Um, and this was also the first moment that we had community engagement in this project where we recorded over 100 new oral history testimonials from Japanese Canadians, but also of bystanders and witnesses. For me, that's been an incredibly important resource and um, being able to, when we think about trying to make research accessible, being able to hear um, in people's own voices, their experiences is incredibly compelling and um, that was part of, we wanted to be able to provide a platform for those voices. So we had all of this archival research material and we were tasked with a way of trying to find a way to make that content relatable and accessible to the public. Trying to you know, tap into something that resonates emotionally and would really prompt reflection and inquiry. So the way that we did this was through um, a curatorial method that we call a participatory approach to exhibit making. This isn't particularly novel. Um, it's a trend that actually emerged in Canada in the 90s, but it was a really effective way to offer a platform for communities to tell their own stories. A lot of my research, I think about these ideas of how do we respectfully represent the voices of those with lived experience and effectively communicate research. How do we account for multiple perspectives? How do we um, convey you know, a layered sense of history? And how do we balance primary source objects and research, letting those objects speak for themselves, but providing enough context and interpretation that we can really, really meaningfully engage with them? So this is just an example of a few of the different community engaged projects. And I looking back at these now in a post COVID era, like, oh, I miss the idea of being all in the same room. Um, but we hosted a whole range of different community engaged events that invited output or invited input from the community at basically every step of the exhibit from figuring out the key messages to testing out the language in the um, on the exhibit walls to beta testing some of the really cool interactive features that we created. We made an app and um, interactive teacher resources. So a lot of those elements where the community was deeply integrated in that. The other thing that we did to um, convey individual and collective experiences as much as possible was that we made the curatorial decision to tell this history through narrators. And this is one such example. I'm sharing a picture from one of our panels um, of the Kigetsu family. And I am I feel incredibly honored to have been able to collaborate with many of the families that are featured in the exhibit. This is one of many. And um, this was, oh, I, have, I have chills thinking about the opportunity to have been able to share research, take time to work through archival files with the families, comb through family photo albums, and really develop a lot of the interpretive content um, alongside families. So I'm going to share with you one example of the narrators that are featured through our exhibits. 
um, we chose to have seven families and um, they are among, as I said, the thousands whose um, families have been impacted by the forced dispossession. And the history of this is still affecting families today. Um, the way that we came about this is again, it was a research task. And in this photo here, you can see my colleagues, Dr. Trevor Weideman and PhD candidate, Caitlin Finley, they were instrumental in doing a huge amount of research and analysis, combing through, as I mentioned, those tens of thousands of archival records to help find um, a diverse sampling of Japanese Canadian experiences that would help us show that individual and collective experience. Um, we based that on geographical diversity, on occupational class diversity. We wanted to show a range of experiences um, and occupations, um, women, children, families. Um, one of our narrator was a bachelor who was just on starting his career. The Kigetsu family was um, had a forestry empire. So we wanted to really show a range of experiences and also to highlight the rich archival material that we had pulling from the BC archives, as well as the collection of the Nikkei National Museum and the Libraries and Archive Canada research materials that we had. Uh, the little avatars on the bottom I'm particularly excited about, that was um, a collaborative process working with Kim and the educational team at the RBCM. And you can see that we have individual avatars um, attached to each of our narrators. And so you can follow their stories as you walk through the exhibit. And um, it's set up chronology, so you, chronologically. So as you walk through the exhibit, you start by seeing this rich and varied nature of the Japanese Canadians' lives before dispossession. And then you can find, pick out um, the, their avatars as you move through history to follow their stories. So now I'm gonna give you a cheeky sneak peek to two such examples within the exhibit of what that looks like. So as you move in, um, as I mentioned, the first room is really painting a picture of life before dispossession, because if we're going to meet, tell, you know, a story of loss, it's really important to show what people, what people had in order to understand what was taken and what was lost. So we have a range of stories and individuals. And the one that I want to share with you today is the Ategi family. And this is one of my favorite photos in the exhibit that was shared to us by the family. And these are the Ategi brothers in front of their boatwork factory in Steedston. And theirs is a story of, um, you know, of, work and camaraderie, but also of family heirlooms. And in the first room, we feature a selection of traditional boat making tools. And these are on loan from the Nikkei National Museum. And I think it's actually worth merit. It's worth saying, um, these are, we chose these objects specifically to help tell the story, to paint the picture of what life was like for the Ategi brothers building boats. But of course, we don't have the actual, their family heirlooms, because as you move through the exhibit, you'll learn as you move through, you'll encounter a letter from the Ategi brothers um, to the letter, to the office of the custodian. And um, this is one of the interactives in the exhibit where um, we have curated a selection of primary source um, materials and you'll find um, a back and forth you'll see on the on the left hand side that um, the Ategis receive notice that they hear while they are in internment that the Ategi boat works and their homes have been looted and it's been broken into and pilfered. They write to the office of the custodian um, informing them that there was a secret compartment in their home when they learned that they have to move into internment camps in very short notice, they chose, like many families, they actually chose to hide away some of their family heirlooms for safekeeping. And upon notice of hearing that the government had broken their promise to protect their property, they said, please, please go and please find this compartment 
So I've drawn a map to the Sea Queen compartment. Please, can you check to see if our family heirlooms are still there? And the letter that they receive in response um, is from a government official who said, unfortunately, this has been pilfered. The Sea Queen compartment was found, and it would have taken a superhuman effort to have protected it. And for me, this kind of when I encountered this map, I found it chilling. It told the story of so many kinds of losses. This is not just the loss of, a, of tools. This is the loss of heirloom, of culture, of heritage, of, um, of family and tradition. So um, as you go through the exhibit, you will get a sense of, we tried it to paint this picture both of the complicated back and forth correspondence between government officials and Japanese Canadians who were trying to navigate their life and understanding and protesting the dispossession of their property from internment camps. And while we have included these narrators, and I mentioned you can follow the narrators through the exhibit, we also wanted to provide spaces to have other um, other Japanese Canadian stories as well as, as well as witnesses and bystanders, as I mentioned. And so there are AV features dotted throughout that allow for those deeper dives and our spaces to sit down and engage with further stories. Um, and in the last section, we move forward, we bring the story all the way up to today because these are um, fundamentally um, the legacies of dispossession are permanent. And that's one of the key outcomes from the landscapes of injustice research. And so we created an oral history um, theater that enables you to hear, again, first person stories about um, the legacies of this history. And in the very last room, you know, this includes stories from Mark Sakamoto um, of his family's rice box. And in the very last room, we've included a section for feedback. Um, we found in the research about curating difficult histories, it's important to have a platform for the audience to also be able to have space to reflect and um, participate in this history. And so I'd encourage everybody, please take a look at the Landscapes of Injustice website. Feel free to, um, log on to the website that I've linked here that to add your own thoughts about what it means now that you know this history. Um, for me, as I said, it was, um, it felt important to translate this research into a way that, um, that we can engage with so that we can ensure that this doesn't happen again and that we continually think about our own roles and, um, in history and how how we can make meaningful contributions to better create a better future for ourselves. So I think I can pause at that point to ask answer any questions, comments, concerns. I've given you the whistle stop tour because I'm hoping that you're going to come see the exhibit in person. But of course, um, I welcome any comments or questions about any of the content that I've shared at this stage. Oh, thank you so much, Yasmin. Um, I'll get you to stop sharing your screen so folks can see you again. And um, one thing I'm curious about, and we were talking a little bit about it just as we were getting ready to get started. This is a seven year project. Um, so you've been deeply uh, immersed in just the, the documents, but also the communities and the stories. How, what is sort of held on to you? I'm sure it's hard to, to let this go. So what, what are the sort of um, reverberations that you're still experiencing or how is this work gonna continue for you? Oh, it's a wonderful question. Um, so for me, I, I do wear many hats. I'm a curator and I'm, I am an art historian. I'm a public historian and I'm interested in um, a big part of my research here. Not was not just only on this this part of Canadian history, but also on how do we make effective exhibits that really integrate community that um, we're increasingly seeing, I mentioned at the outset, this idea about community engaged research and exhibit making, and that has become a real, um, a real passion of mine. And 
So I'm looking forward to finding ways to share um, to share some of the lessons learned in that way for other for other communities and other stories. Um, it's also been extraordinary being able to work with the Japanese Canadian community. Um, I know that a few members of our community council, for instance, are joining us here today. So hello to Mary and, and others. Um, the relationships that came out of this, um, out of this project have been humbling and amazing friendships. And I'm so grateful that I, that is a legacy in itself, how to, being able to have it's I, words fail. I'm, I'm really grateful that I've been able to have those relationships. Um, I saw a wonderful question from Kathy. Um, a comment about hoping COVID is over so the public can see it. Um, I will share um, a few points. So in addition to the exhibit itself, we have had the opportunity to extend the tour. So it will be going on for several months, well into 2023, 24. And we have created a whole suite of online interpretive tools to accompany it. So that includes a self-guided app, an online digital catalog, um, as well as, as I mentioned, my colleagues in teacher resources have created some incredible, wonderful interactives. There's a beautiful narrative website and um, the archives as well. And my research partners are doing wonderful work, continuing discussions with the JC community and others to um, continue having those dialogues. So there are lots of opportunities to engage from afar. Yes, and we've posted those links to the narrative website. Um, so that's essentially you're getting to follow those stories of those, um, those different threads that go through the exhibit. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, so you can follow the stories. And there's also a book, I believe, um, that was published. So I've got a link to the, uh, the book as well. And it's called A Landscapes of Justice, A New Perspective on Internment and Dispossession of Japanese Canadians. So uh, yeah, I think that's a really wonderful thing, all the different ways that um, you have um, found um, for different people to engage, whether it's families or academics or uh, somebody who wanders in off the street to see the exhibition. I think there's, uh, it's been a real, it seemed to be a very concentrated effort. And I, I'm sure that'll pay dividends because no matter what your experience or previous knowledge is, there's an avenue for you to explore and, and to get to see it. So it's fantastic. Um, oh, oh, and Carolyn, Carolyn makes it. <laughs> Excellent point. Thank you, Carolyn, at the Nikkei National Museum. I'm delighted to um, that you've joined us. Um, the Nikkei National Museum is open with, with COVID safety protocols. And part of, we were incredibly fortunate, actually, that we were far enough along in the exhibit, in the curatorial planning, that when COVID hit, we were able to pivot so that we could make this a safe exhibit for people to be able to engage with. So we were able to adjust some of our interactives to ensure that there's enough PPC and that similarly things like the catalog would be available online. So COVID protocols was definitely part of the planning process, which is, we were very lucky that we were able to um, pivot so quickly. Yes. So if you live in, in, the, in the health region of the Nikkei National Museum, get in touch, we'll probably have to book a ticket uh, because that it will be um, limited, but you can get the chance to see it in person if you live in that area. And then we saw all those great dates um, for where it's traveling. Can you remind me, Yasin, what is the, the next stop after, um, after the Nikkei? Absolutely, so it's going to be traveling to Toronto. Um, it will be at the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center from September through to December of 2021. And then it goes to the Museum of Surrey, um, to the Royal BC Museum, and then to the Canadian Museum of Immigration in Halifax, and then Gott Museum and Archive. And also I'm delighted to share that we will have, um, we also were able to produce a small modular version of the exhibit that can go to regional, um, regional museums and cultural centers and um, places that wouldn't have had, might not have had the square footage to be able to have the exhibit in the full exhibit. But to your question earlier, Kim, this is a very much a history that is on our doorstep. 
and we wanted to be able to ensure that um, those communities had access to this history also. So um, please do check out the, Na the Nikkei National Museum website has further details. And so even if you're not able to visit Victoria or Burnaby, there's a very good chance that the smaller version might be coming to you. So. That's so great. Uh, yeah, so, and so important for getting into the smaller communities as well. Uh, there's one question here, it's uh, such a great question. We're gonna end with this question from Ian who's watching here on Zoom. And Ian says, what a wonderful presentation and looking forward to seeing the exhibit. Wondering if during your preparation, you found yourself becoming depressed over this very sad history. Was there some uh, impacts from that? <clears throat> a wonderful question. And curating difficult histories is, um, it, yeah, it's a sobering topic. And um, it's been interesting. It's one that I haven't, I didn't want to shy away from the difficult elements of this story, but I also wanted to really understand the richness and diversity of people's experience because it's, there is absolutely, there is heartbreak and lost opportunities, but there's also very much stories of resilience and hope. And um, I, I think a big part for me in learning this history, it was part of, I, I wanted to learn more. I, and I think that the best thing that we can do to be good citizens is to, is to listen and to understand as best as we can. And so that was a big part of my job was listening and um, I am incredibly proud of what we put together, but I do think that it's mostly, this is as much as possible was a platform for um, conveying, um, allowing individuals to have space to share their stories and also to um, think of ways to really make academic research tangible and accessible. And so it, um, it's, it's definitely, um, but yeah, it's, it, it is a difficult history. There's no denying that. And that also really inspired the choice of how we wanted to end the exhibit in recognition that this is a difficult topic and to give space for reflection and, um, and understanding. So it's, yeah, a, a great question. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you, Ian. And thank you, Yasmin, um, for giving us a glimpse uh, of what the exhibit looks like and for all of the great ways there are to, for us to explore it, even if we can't visit there in person. And just to clarify, um, Carolyn at the Nikkei um, clarified that attendance is drop in, but you can check the calendar to confirm that they're open. And there is a link there in, in our um, chat window. So thank you all, everyone who's joined us uh, here on Zoom and those watching on Facebook and to those of you who may watch the recording, uh, because if you did join us late or you missed us and you want to go back, this has been recorded and you will find it on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So please have a look there. And if you'd like to learn more about this topic, RBCM Outside on May 20th is going to be going to um, the site of the Esquimalt Tea House. So that'll be on May the 20th and, and it's called Hidden History of the Esquimalt Tea House. And that'll be a, a live virtual program. So you can see more information on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube, uh, website, sorry. And our museum has reopened and our new feature exhibition, Orcas, Our Shared Future is on now. And if you live locally, we encourage you to find out more about time tickets. And if you don't live locally, we do have virtual opportunities for you to explore. Our next RBCM at Home, which is also International Museums Day, is May 18th. And I'll be hosting a former museum exhibit tech uh, artist. He was a diorama artist, and we're going to learn more about the creation of some of our most iconic dioramas here. And at 1 p.m., Chris is going to be hosting an event highlighting museums from across the country. And at 11 p.m., this you heard correct, 11 p.m., both Chris and I will take you behind the scenes in a sort of choose your own adventure style uh, visit of the Royal BC Museum. So thank you everyone. And until then, until the next time, please take care of yourselves and one another. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much.